Please welcome Minister Peter Altmaier. Yes, good uh, morning, everybody. Ambassador Schaefer, uh, Mr. Quant, uh, dear Ed Davy, we have been colleagues and friends in the European Council of Ministers for Energy and uh, Climate, and we were fighting uh, very hard to better protect um, globally our climate. And dear friends, let me first of all extend to you on behalf of the government, of the entire government, and um, especially on behalf of the Chancellor, the very warm wishes and a very warm welcome to Berlin. The Chancellor personally is uh, convicted and convinced that this kind of exchange is badly needed to overcome global problems concerning all of us. The Chancellor herself has, uh, spent, uh, has spent a visit in China last week. She uh, returned back home this morning from a summit in La Valletta in Malta between 28 um, heads of government of European Union and 35 African presidents. She will leave uh, Sunday morning for the G20 summit in Turkey and uh, there is literally no single day, almost no single hour where she is not in touch with an international colleague uh, dealing with international affairs. This is the agenda of a national head of government today in a globalized world. And therefore, the issue you have uh, put so prominently uh, on the table this morning is an issue that concerns all of us. We have, uh, over the last 150 years, seen a ever closer connecting and interconnecting world. Perhaps it all began not far from here, where the Siemens company is vested when Werner von Siemens extended the telegraph within a couple of years around the world. Because that was the moment where you could have real-time knowledge about everything that was going on on every continent and literally on every city and village. And ever since, we have seen a process of closer interconnecting people, economies, and countries. Today, the nation state is more popular than ever. In ever-changing worlds, people feel the nation state as a kind of safe heaven, as the uh, guarantee for their identities. Yes, that is true. But at the same time, the nation state is less and less delivering the goods. Every single country around the globe depends on other countries and on developments and evolutions outside that country. Let's take Germany, for example. Germany is uh, dependent as far as uh, energy supply is concerned, as far as, far as food is concerned, as far as raw materials are concerned. Germany depends from others as far as uh, certain skills, as far as IT technologies are concerned. And this is true for every other country, even for a big superpower like the United States, and certainly for China as well, at least, if China will continue to be not only an emerging country, but one day one of the biggest industrialized countries around the world. And my thesis is that as higher developed a country will be, as more dependent it will be by international developments in other regions of the world. And we have uh, seen many, many uh, events that have confirmed this interdependency. And we are now living and witnessing an unprecedented event that demonstrates us in a nutshell how far we have grown. Over the last 30, 50 years, we have uh, developed free movement of goods, free movement of products, of capitals, of services, of ideas, of informations around the globe. And some people thought you can just limit it to that. You can just limit it to that, but they have forgotten one thing, that is the human factor. There are people. And as more developed 
a country in Africa or in Asia is, as more people will have access to this information society and as soon as they can afford paying a few hundred or a few thousand dollars to an international trafficker in illegal immigration, they will, think starting, they will start thinking about leaving the area where they see no perspectives for themselves and even more important for their children. And that's just what happened with regard to Africa and with regard to the Middle East. In the Middle East and in the north of Africa, we are witnessing the um, continuing collapse of a state order that was established after the First World War. It was established by colonial powers. It was never entirely recognized, but it lasted for almost 100 years. And now, over the last 20 years, one country after the other collapsed. It all began in Somalia. And still today, we have not really restored state order in Somalia. It continued in countries like Libya, Yemen, Syria. Syria as a humanitarian disaster that is unprecedented. According to all the information we have, there have been 22 million Syrians when the civil war broke out. 11 out of the 22 millions today are refugees. Four million uh, are staying in Turkey, two million, and in Jordania, Lebanon, Egypt, and some other countries. Seven millions are moving desperately across Syria from one place to another, fleeing the regime of Mr. Assad and fleeing the terrorist attacks from Islamic State as well. And this means, because we are interconnected, because we are living in a global village, that the humanitarian disaster in Syria cannot be confined to Syria as such. It has an immediate impact on the neighboring country. When you see that in a country like Lebanon, uh, with 6.5 million people, there are almost 1.5 million refugees. In Turkey, 2 million refugees, I mentioned already. Uh, and then, when these people are starting to move, it is a exodus, it is a, a migra migration uh, fact and factor that uh, cannot be stopped, that cannot be controlled, that affects the stability of an entire region. The stability of the Middle East has already been affected by civil war and terrorism. But the stability of the entire Balkan region is at stake. When you see every day since August, every day between 60,000 and 80,000 people moving from Turkey via Greece to Macedonia, to Serbia, to Croatia, to Slovenia, to Austria, to Germany, to Sweden, to Denmark, to the Netherlands, and to many other countries in Europe. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a challenge for all of us. And the question is, how will we respond to that challenge? Will we simply say, every nation is dealing by its own with that crisis? Will we say, every, every nation is closing the borders, refusing the refugees, uh, not participating in international efforts to overcome the crisis? And what is our answer going to be when we see the natural disasters, the political disasters, the environmental disasters, the social disasters in many African countries? When we see people thinking exactly in the same way of fleeing the country? Certainly, Europe is a zone of welfare and prosperity. And Germany has an enormously good reputation around the world. When I was a student and I traveled the Middle East, every child, Mr. Quant, knew what BMW means. Uh, Mr. Mr. Beckenbauer and BMW have been the brands of Germany at that time. And uh, at least BMW still is part of a positive <laughs> brand uh, for the country. And ladies and gentlemen, this is true. There are pull factors 
There are pull factors when somebody from Albania comes to Germany because the um, financial, um, the financial uh, uh, amount he will be entitled to is much higher than everything he can earn in Albania by working very hard uh, 10 hours a day, seven, hour, seven days a week. But for the people in Syria, for the people in Yemen, for the people in Iraq and Afghanistan, there is not in the first place a pull factor. We have lots of push factors. These people have lost confidence in a good and decent perspective for themselves and for their children. And therefore, we need an international approach. Ambassador, let me say it uh, very, very fast and uh, uh, just in a nutshell. We need, we have an international responsibility. The UNHCR, the World Food Program, they are all committed to fight the crisis, but they have been left alone by many, many richer and more wealthy countries. When I see that the food that was, uh, the amount of money that was available for a refugee in Lebanon and Jordania was reduced from $30 a month to $13 a month this summer. And then can you imagine what it means for the people and their personal situation and their uh, fear of, uh, of, of starving uh, 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 in, the, in the camps? And when you see that we have now managed to increase the amount because we were alerted by the situation. We have increased it to $23. We are still far away, far away from the $30 that would be needed to allow people to have a, not a decent life, but just to have a life there in the refugee camps. We have an unresolved crisis, not just because in Syria we have a civil war that is uh, terrible, where radical Muslim groups like uh, Al-Qaeda, called uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, like Islamic State, uh, the Free Syrian Army, and the troops of Mr. Assad are fighting an endless fight. But it is because the, the, the diverging interests of countries like Iran, like Saudi Arabia, like the US, like Russia, the Europeans, Egypt, and many, many others, are preventing us from coming to solution. And this is why Germany and Chancellor Merkel, when the crisis broke out, had to make a strategic choice. The, tra the strategic choice has been either to hide behind others and to wait what the outcome of that crisis would be, to protect the national sovereignty as good as possible, or to take, and this is something I, I never say publicly, to take, uh, and I, I wouldn't say that is a correct word, to take a lead, no, to take a courageous step that could inspire others. That was the challenge uh, we have seen and finally accepted. And this courageous step has been when people were freely f uh, 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 floating in Hungary 30,000 people, that was by the end of August, to say we will not stop these people at the borders. We will accept the people when they are coming and when they are asking for asylum. There is no such a right as freedom of movement internationally for economic reasons. We cannot allow everybody around the world to look for a job in a single and specific country. This right does not exist. But when there are people in need, people in danger of life, people who have lost almost everything, then we have a responsibility according what we say our European values, but you could say uh, from your point of view, our universal values we are all committed to. And we have accepted uh, these people, we have helped those people in order to make it possible to come to an international and European solution. It has three pillars. Pillar number one, is the fact that um, we have to find a solution for Syria. Everybody knows it will not be easy and it will take some time. Second, then nobody can be interested in an unprecedented exodus where country after country in the Middle East would collapse. Therefore, we want to re-establish perspectives for the people to stay and to live in the region. 
especially in Turkey, one of the stable countries in that region. But then we have to make sure that people have access to schooling, that people have access to housing, that people have access to the labor markets. And we have to offer some quota for the European Union as far as resettlement of refugees is concerned in order to make it possible for a certain number of people every year to come to Europe and to stay at least until the crisis in Syria or Iraq is over. This is a very <coughs> demanding exercise. And it means we have to recognize other countries will have to play a key role as well, not just Germany or the Europeans. It is something that has been negotiated and decided amongst partners. And then the second pillar is the uh, European responsibility. The European Union, and uh, I will not discuss whether it is an ever closer union or just a close union or just a union. There are political arguments, <laughs> dear Ed, you will, you will uh, uh, have to argue uh, for many, many weeks uh, now uh, ahead of the referendum in the UK. But as a matter of fact, we are a union without internal borders. And we are facing, again, a choice, like Angela Merkel faced the choice when the people came from Hungary. And the choice is, will we really re-establish borders between member states of the European Union? Will we really re-establish fences and controls everywhere? And do we believe we could confine the controls just to persons coming illegally without affecting the free, move, the free uh, the, of movement of goods and services and everything else. Therefore, we believe Europe should act together. And that means a quota inside Europe. That means financial solidarity inside Europe. That means cooperation alongside the Balkan route between all the countries affected by the flow of um, immigration. And then the third pillar, this is our national responsibility. Uh, we, have, we have decided not to say no, but we are now in a situation where we have to say yes to the integration of the people who will stay in Germany for a certain period or even forever. Many of the people will return back home if the civil war in Syria or in Iraq will end in a foreseeable future. Many others will stay. But how, whatever the individual choice of those people will be, we will have to make sure that uh, there, is, uh, a, there is a perspective for language teaching, a perspective for professional training, a perspective for integration. We have an order of values and state and rule of law that we believe is the key for the success of Germany over the past 70 years. We want the refugees to know that order and to accept that order. And I have no doubts that most of them who have flown dictatorship, civil wars, terrorism, will happily accept this order because it is a humanitarian order. And by integrating the people, by showing that the national identity is not weakened, but even strengthened when you explain your own model, your own values, your own constitution, your own laws, and your own culture, then I believe we could take away also fears and concerns in other countries, and we could encourage them to do what is indispensable, to act together and to share responsibilities. Thank you so much for listening to me.